the Joker, Batman's arch nemesis, often depicted as one of his, if not his main rival. From Jack Nicholson to Heath Ledger, this iconic character had been dramatised on the big screen. And many would argue that Heath Ledger's performance depicted the mad clown of terror in a way never seen before, and thus would bring his career to an end, as well as his life, with that performance. It was alleged that playing the Joker caused Heath to go mad, lose his sanity and grip on reality, and caused him to take his own life. That's just the effect the Joker had on him. But he wasn't the only one. On the 20th of July 2012, a man dressed in tactical gear head to toe and a gas mask broke into the Aurora Movie Theatre in Colorado and fired multiple rounds with his rifle and killed 12 people at the Batman Dark Knight Rises screening. The killer, James Holmes, called himself the Joker. Just a disclaimer, this case is... Just a disclaimer, this case is... James Egan Holmes, born in San Diego, California to a mathematician father and his mother a registered nurse. He had one sister, and during his childhood, James exhibited mental health issues which caused him to be frightened by what he called nail ghosts. These ghosts would often be heard by James hammering into the walls at night. According to his lawyer, Daniel King, James suffered from mental health issues in middle school and attempted suicide at the age of 11. And at the age of 12, James began to decline socially at his school. This would prompt social worker Margaret Roth to get involved and after seeing him only once, she would send him to psychiatrist Lynn Fenton. And Lynn would note that James was suffering from depression and was obsessed with killing. And this obsession had continued over the span of a decade. As time went on, James moved into his own apartment, which he shared with another student. He joined a few dating sites, tried to lead a normal life. He described himself as quiet and easygoing, and he was an agnostic. He also began to date a fellow student, however she would end the relationship and would go on to say that James would often make flat jokes, making people feel uncomfortable and would express his desire to kill people. She would tell James to seek professional help and later James would tell a psychiatrist that his breakup contributed to his violent behaviour and spiralled him into further depression. In the fall of 2010, James was employed at a pill and capsule coating factory in San Diego and one of his co-workers would later go on to say that he was unsociable and once acted strangely at a laboratory workstation by staring at a blank wall and not verbally responding, only making a quick glance and smirking when his co-worker asked him if he was okay. At the beginning of graduate school, James' condition would worsen. He started to see shadows and flickers at the corner of his eyes which would fight each other with firearms and other weapons. Dr. Lynn Fenton testified at his trial and she was worried about his homicidal ideologies expressed in their last meeting. She saw him a total of seven times over three months, twice with a male psychiatrist. However, James would go on to reject their suggestion for treatment. And in July 2012, after James had sent her a threatening email, she activated a threat assessment team to help her formulate a plan for him. She expressed concerns about his social phobia and psychotic level thinking and believed he may have schizoid personality disorder. She listed specific concerns such as his long-standing fantasies about killing people and killing as many of them as possible, his reluctance to discuss any details about his plan, his refusal to allow them to talk to anyone else and his unclear timeline. She didn't know if he was always that way or if this was new behaviour. Despite these issues, James would go on to graduate with a degree in neuroscience. But on the 20th of July 2012, everything would change. James entered a movie theatre and killed 12 people and injured a further 70. But months before the 20th of July, James planned his attack. He thought about where he wanted his attack to take place, which would be best suited for a mass shooting, such as a shopping mall and even an airport but ruled it out because an airport would have too much security and he was worried that people would confuse it with an act of terrorism and that just wasn't the message he wanted to give. He eventually selected the Century 16 theatre for his attack because he liked movie theatres and that specific theatre had doors that he could lock in order to increase the number of casualties as well as being in an area where it would take longer for police to respond. He specifically chose to attack at a midnight screening because he believed fewer children would be present, not wanting to kill them. See, the message James wanted to give was, there is no message. 
He just wanted to kill as many people as he could. He knew he could, so he would. Now that he selected a location, James would consider the weapons he wanted to use in his attack. He had considered using explosives, chemical and biological agents. However, he rejected these ideas because he was worried he'd blow himself up in the process. At one point, he did consider becoming a serial killer as a career, but again rejected the idea as he reasoned that it was too personal and he'd leave too much evidence behind, he'd get caught very easily and it was just too few kills and James wanted to maximise his kills. If he was going to get caught, he wanted to kill as many people as possible. So on the 22nd of May 2012, he purchased a Glock 22 pistol at a Ganda mountain shop in Aurora. Six days later on May the 28th, he bought a Remington 870 Express tactical shotgun at a Bass Pro Shop store in Denver. On June the 7th, he purchased the Smith & Wesson m and 15 sport rifle. All three of these weapons were bought legally and a background check had been performed. In the four months prior to the shooting, he also bought 3,000 rounds of ammunition for his pistol, 3,000 rounds for his M&P 15, 350 shells for his shotgun, and all of this over the internet. And on July the 2nd, he placed an order for a Black Hawk Urban Assault Vest, two magazine holders and a knife at an online store. He also purchased spike strips, which he later admitted that he planned to use it in case a car chase would be in pursuit or police shot at him. On June the 25th, so less than a month before the shooting, James emailed an application to join a gun club in Bryars, Colorado. The owner Glenn Rodkovich called him several times throughout to invite him to a mandatory orientation but could only reach his answer phone. James would eventually respond and left Rotkovich one voicemail in reply. And Rotkovich found the voicemail to be bizarre, freaky, spoken with a deep voice, incoherent and rambling. He would later say that looking back, I'd say he sounded like the Joker from the movie. It was like someone was trying to be as weird as possible. On July the 19th, so just hours before the shooting started, James mailed a notebook to his psychiatrist detailing his thoughts and plans during that week preceding the shooting. He also called a crisis hotline for mental health and with the hopes that somebody would talk him out of committing the massacre at the last minute. However, the call was disconnected after 9 seconds. The day of the shooting, he walked into the movie theatre and purchased a ticket to the new Batman movie. After the movie was underway, he went out of a rear exit door propped it open and gathered his weapon. He got himself dressed head to toe in protective tactical gear. So he was wearing a ballistic helmet, a protective gear for his legs, throat and groin, black gloves and a gas mask before re-entering through the same door. As he re-entered, he tossed a canister, which police initially thought was a gas canister. However, later confirmed that it was an unknown substance. Jennifer Seeger, who survived the attack, said that she had seen the man and thought his get-up was part of the entertainment for the debut of the film. She said the man first shot towards the ceiling, then began shooting at the people. He reloaded during his attack. He was just literally massacring everybody and anybody that got up that was trying to run away, Seeger said. Screaming and panicked moviegoers scrambled to escape but James just kept on shooting as he walked up the theatre. It was a scene straight out of a horror film, said Chris Romas who was inside the theatre. He was just literally shooting everyone like hunting season. James had killed 12 people and wounded 70. Police responded immediately to the distress call and James surrendered without resisting within 7 minutes of the first call being made. Victims overwhelmed hospitals. One of the injured was just 4 months old. The child's mother said the infant was treated and released from the hospital and is okay. Many would post on social media in real time as the events were taking place within the theatre. James was initially calm and detached during the arrest but became interested in watching the aftermath of the shooting after being put in the back of a police car. Once apprehended, James told the police that he had booby trapped his apartment with explosive devices before heading to the theatre. He had booby trapped it with various devices, chemical devices and trip wires which would take police days to work through safely. The first thing police did was evacuate five buildings around the apartment. Residents were allowed to go back in briefly to retrieve emergency items such as medicine. On July the 20th, 2012, police break a window at James' apartment to assess the situation and see what they were dealing with. Law enforcement officers prepared to disarm the booby-trapped apartment the very next day. They set up an explosive device within the apartment. Soon after, debris flew out the window after the officers detonated the device from inside the apartment. 
James appeared in court on July the 23rd, 2012, with his hair dyed reddish orange, similar to the Joker, and showed little emotion. He had a blank stare and appeared to be in a daze. He would be found guilty very quickly and sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. So that's going to do it for today, guys. Um, thank you very much for watching the video. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so. It really helps us out. Until next time, have a good day.